Hey, welcome everyone to the 2023 In Pursuit of a Cure Research Update webinar. My name is Catherine Royce, and I'm the Fundraising and Special Projects Manager for the IFOPA. On behalf of the entire IFOPA team, we're really glad you're with us today. Much of this information will be new for everyone attending, and we're excited to share these updates with you. This is the fourth year of the In Pursuit of a Cure campaign. The IFOPA began funding research at the University of Pennsylvania in 1990. In 2015, we added the IFOPA's first competitive research grant program, ACT for FOP. Gene therapy was added to the IFOPA's research portfolio in 2020 when we partnered with the University of Massachusetts in the first research grant for gene therapy into FOP. Since then, with the generous support of the FOP community and FOP national organizations, Nearly $1.7 million has been raised to fund transformational FOP research, including gene therapy, the Stop Bob clinical trial, and Act for FOP competitive research grants. On average, these types of scientific strides take millions and millions of dollars. We've reached nearly 1.7 million, but we still have a long way to go. In 2023, we've already raised over $277,000 of our $425,000 goal with generous gifts from donors around the world. The IFOPA is incredibly grateful to these families and national organizations that have made generous gifts this year. As I mentioned, this type of research takes a tremendous investment, and it is only because of this generous support that the IFOPA can continue funding this critical research. Today's webinar is being led by the IFOPA's Director of Research Development and Partnerships, Danielle Kirkovich. Danielle holds a PhD in Biomedical Sciences from Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Danielle has worked in post-war rehabilitation, spinal cord injury and amputation, including trauma-induced heterotopic ossification, and in rare pediatric cancers and lysosomal diseases, where she is responsible for bringing the first treatment for CLN3 disease to trial. Since joining the IFOPA in April 2021, Danielle has led the development of the IFOPA's research strategy and priorities while collaborating with the IFOPA's research committee and board, FOP researchers, clinicians, and industry partners. Danielle, thank you for leading this exciting webinar, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Catherine. So uh, thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, I get the exciting part. I get to lead um, into some wonderful work and that we're very excited to share with you. So today we'd like to take you on a journey showing you how multiple approaches to the treatment of FOP may converge to address, it, address the healthcare needs of those with FOP across the entire lifespan. We want to commend the investigators who found the gene mutation responsible for FOP, which today allows us to make proper diagnoses and has led directly to the gene therapy program. Of course, we'd like to update you on the gene therapy program. And we want to share how other approaches to the treatment of FOP, such as immunotherapy, Pelaveratine and other medications under investigation can work with gene therapy to support a lifetime of health, and how emerging new medicines made from RNA may be used to treat flare-ups or prevent the recurrence of heterotopic bone following surgery. Danielle, I'm sorry, um, your slides are not showing. They're not? My no. goodness. Well, that's not helpful. <laughs> Is that showing now? Let me, let me try that again. Thanks for yeah. letting me know. You're welcome. Okay, share the screen. Let's try that again. Now, do you see slides? I see lots of slides. All right. I see notes. Okay. There you okay. go. Yay. Okay. Thank you. I wasn't hired for my IT abilities. 
Um, okay, so uh, let me see if I can go through this a little more quickly so we can get to the our gifted and uh, talented researchers I know you want to hear from. Um, so today we're going to talk about the lifespan of the individual and how there are multiple approaches, such as you know, getting a correct diagnosis, which we commend the investigators for discovering the gene for us. Gene therapy that we'll talk about today, medications that are in trial and are coming up to, for trial, and how RNA may be used to treat flares and to suppress um, heterotopic ossification following surgery. Those who discovered the, the gene, um, Eileen Shore and Fred Kaplan, you'll see on your far left of the screen. Um, these are members of a larger gene therapy working group to inform and advise the work, uh, the work you'll hear about today. So this is a large group of individuals and what are not shown are their collaborators as well and individuals in their labs hard at work. So it's a really big team working on this program led by Dr. Jay Shim. As you're well aware, FOP is a musculoskeletal disorder where bone grows and remains in areas of the body where it's not supposed to be. Ligaments and tendons can be affected, but bone mostly takes up space where muscle is supposed to be. We see sheets of bone across the shoulder blades in the lower part of this picture, down the spinal cord and around the rib cage. FOP is a genetic disorder, which means there's a mistake in the blueprint used to make and run our bodies. The human body is made up of 30 to 40 trillion cells, each with a copy of a master DNA blueprint, which is organized into 23 pairs of 20,000 segments of DNA called genes. Each of the 23 pairs contains two copies of a gene, one from mom and one from dad. Healthy genes uh, depicted here make RNA templates, which then make proteins, the workhorses of our body, such as enzymes we use to break up food and photoreceptors we use to see, and the ACEVR1 gene, which helps muscle regeneration and repair. When there's a mistake in the genetic blueprint, that mistake gets translated into a mistake in the RNA and ultimately a mistake in the protein, um, such as happens in FOP with a dysfunctional ACVR1 receptor or also called an ALK2 receptor protein. In those of us without FOP, musculoskeletal stem cells respond to injury by dividing to make more of themselves. These cells mature into myoblasts, myocytes, which then fuse into skeletal muscle myotubes and skeletal muscle fibers are formed. It's a maturation process. Mature skeletal muscle cells, like shown on the far right myofiber, do not divide after we're born. They're replenished throughout our lifetime in this manner. Researchers estimate that complete turnover of our entire skeletal muscle system occurs over 15 years worth of time. If we look at this from another angle, we see skeletal muscle fibers on the left, as shown in the previous slide, and in the right, as if we're looking down a group of those muscle fibers like a handful of straws. In between these regenerating myofibers are cells you may have heard of called fibroadipogenic progenitor cells, or FAPs, shown here in the orange circle. In healthy individuals without FLP, FAPs, help direct and support the process of muscle stem cell regeneration shown in the last slide. A muscle is injured as shown in the upper left corner of the fig figure, which causes muscle stem cells that I showed earlier to make more of themselves. This message is reinforced by healthy, helpful neighboring FAP cells, telling those muscle stem cells to mature in the pathway I showed you earlier. Once muscles are repaired, FAP cells are no longer needed and die, or if, it, if they are needed, develop into fat or skin cells. They don't make bone in healthy individuals. However, in FOP, communication between the FAPs and muscle stem cells break down due to defects in the ACVR1 receptor. 
Fewer muscle stem cells are made and those that are have difficulty maturing. And in a rotten twist of fate, FAP cells become bone making cells. So let's take a closer look at those uh, troublesome FAP cells. In healthy muscle repair, receptors on the surface of the FAP cells, which are depicted on the right side of the slide, called ACVR1 or L2 receptors, receive bone morphogenic protein or BMP cells from outside the cell, which tell that cell to support muscle regeneration and die or become fat or skin cells when they're done. BMP does not, however, tell FAP cells to become bone making cells. In FOP, we know that these fibroadipogenic uh, progenitor cells aren't communicating well. They're not dying off, they're not becoming fat, and they're not becoming skin. In FOP, BMP or bone morphogenic protein and a protein called activin A starts a chain reaction in the FAP cell, which tells that cell to become a bone making cell. If investigators could fix faulty DNA blueprints, those blueprints won't make RNA resulting in faulty ACVR1 or ALK2 receptor proteins. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jay Shim, who's gonna tell us a lot about that. Dr. Shim? Hello, uh, can I? Yes, I'm working on stopping my sharing. Thanks, Danielle. You're welcome. If it will show me that. Uh, yeah, you should out of uh, uh, stop sharing, Dennis, I can do. Yes, sharing. absolutely. It just moved to my other screen. Sorry about that. Okay. There you go. Can you see my screen? Great. Yes. Okay, and I will move next one. Here we go. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, to deliver therapeutic genes to HO coding cells in FOP patients, we used recombinant adeno associated fighter vector. AV vector was modified to deliver therapeutic genes to target cells without causing any diseases because the, all the risk factors are removed. AV vector has two key elements, AV capsid and AV, uh, AV vector genome. AV capsid can guide where to go, deliver AV vector to muscle cells, FAP cells, cartilage forming chondrocyte and bone forming osteoblast. On the other hand, AV vector genome contains the therapeutic genes to restore the healthy function. Using vector genome, we can add healthy ACBR1 gene or silence mutant ACBR1 gene, or we can do all together, which is add healthy ACBR1 gene at the same time, silence mutant ACBR1 gene. 97% FOP patients have a classic R26A mutation in the ACBR1 gene is here. This mutation is in the DNA form, is carried onto mRNA, messenger RNA, and then mRNA produces mutant ACBR1 R26H protein. It's mRNA to protein. Our first approach, gene therapy approach, is mutant ACBR1 specific silencing using artificial microRNA. This artificial microRNA specifically targets ACBR1 R26H mRNA, then suppress mutant ACBR1 R26H protein expression in FOP cells. Therefore, ACBR1 R26H specific gene silencing can reduce HO forming mutant ACBR1 signaling in FOP cells. The second gene therapy approach is gene replacement. 
expression of a healthy ACPR1 gene can dilute butane ACPR1 signaling in FOP cells. Addition of codon optimized ACPR1 DNA to FOP cells produce normal healthy ACPR1 mRNA and followed by healthy ACPR1 protein. More abundant healthy ACPR1 protein can compete against here butant ACPR1 protein and dilute HO forming butant ACPR1 signaling in FOP cells. Finally, we use the combination strategy to replace butant ACPR1 gene with healthy ACPR1. ACPR1 R26H specific artificial microRNA here suppress butant ACPR1 mRNA and protein, then reduce HO forming butant ACPR1 signaling here. At the same time, addition of a codon optimized ACPR1 DNA make mRNA and ACPR1 healthy protein, then ab abundant healthy ACPR1 protein can dilute the mutant ACPR1 signaling in FOP cells. This strategy replaces mutant ACPR1 gene with healthy ACPR1 gene and may be able to transform FOP cells to healthy cells. To identify the most optimal AV capsid targeting human FOP cells, we generated green fluorescent tagged AV vectors, this one, with 14 different AV capsid. Then we treated human FOP patient derived iPAC cells, which is induced pluripotent stem cells uh, obtained from Dr. Edward Shaw in UCSF. We found that five AV capsid can enter human FOP cells, and these AV capsid will be used to deliver therapeutic genes to FOP cells. Since intramuscular injection itself causes muscle damage to HO in skeletal muscle, we used a hollow microneedle. It's called the micro inject 600 with 0.6 millimeter the needle size to inject the AV vectors into dermis area here. Then AV vectors diffuse to the muscle from to here to here. FOP mice treated with local injection of a green fluorescent packed AV vector show the green signal in muscle. These are all the green signal in the muscle and yellow signal in the purple colored FOP cells, uh, FAP cells. These FAP cells producing HO and then yellow signals, they are uh, uh, enters our uh, FAP cells. Therefore, locally injected AV vector can enter muscle cells as well as HO forming FAPs in FOP mice. We generated AV vector expressing ACPR1 R26H specific artificial microRNA, AMIR RH1 or RH2. The red bars indicate butant ACPR1 mRNA, this one, and blue bars healthy ACPR1 mRNA levels. Compared to these are FOP, non treated FOP cells showing 65% butant ACPR1 mRNA versus 35% healthy ACBR1 mRNA. AV vector treated cells show 37% or 40% the mutant ACBR1 versus 63%, 60% healthy ACBR1 mRNA. Therefore, AV vectors can shift ACBR1 mRNA ratio to healthy conditions. Not only that, we added a codon optimized ACBR1 gene to produce a healthy uh, ACBR1 protein and expressed healthy ACBR1 protein in human FOP cells. Therefore, this combination AV vector not only suppresses mutant ACBR1 expression, but also expresses healthy 
ACPR1 protein. In human FOP cells, activin A binding to a healthy ACPR1 receptor and induce no signal. However, activin A binding to mutant ACPR1 receptor induces SMAD phosphorylation, SMAD15 phosphorylation, activin A plus you can see band come out. However, AV treatment significantly reduce SMAD15 phosphorylation is here. Also, activin A binding to mutant receptor upregulate ID1 expression, the here to here, then AV treatment blunted ID1 expression. Therefore, AV vector is a potent suppressor over activin A induce the HO forming signaling in FOP cells. Human FOP cells can differentiate into pre-osteoblast and then much osteoblast producing extracellular matrix minerals. Non-treated pre-osteoblast produce a high levels of alkan phosphatase. Then when treated with AV vectors, alkan phosphatase activity is significantly decreased. Similarly, much osteoblast the produce minerals and minerals are all the red colored dots here. And when treated with AV vectors, mineralization is significantly decreased. Therefore, AV vectors suppress HO forming osteoblast differentiation of FOP cells. To test the therapeutic efficacy of our AV vectors in FOP mice, we treated a six week old FOP mice with local injection of AV vectors. Three days later, we gave a pinch injury to PBR muscle. And four weeks later, we examined the heterotopic bone formation using micro CT analysis. As expected, non treated uh, FOP mice shows a huge size uh, HO formation is here. However, when treated with gene silencer or healthy ACBR1 expression or the combination, heterotopic bone formation was significantly decreased. Therefore, local injection of AV vectors effectively prevents trauma-induced HO in FOP mice. Similarly, when AV vectors were systemically injected into FOP mice at birth, AV treated FOP mice become resistant to trauma-induced HO. We treated P1, which is a right after birth with a systemic injection of AV vectors. And then six weeks later, we gave a pinch injury to tibial muscle, then uh, we waited this four weeks and examined the heterotopic bone formation in injured muscle. As you see here, non-treated FOP mice develop heterotopic bone here and also all the cartilage tissues inside it too in injured muscle. However, treatment with butant ACBR1 specific gene silencer here or healthy ACBR1 expression is here, these treatment significantly decrease uh, HO formation here. So most strikingly, combination vector here, there was no or little heterotopic bone in injured muscle when treated with combination AV vector is here. Almost nothing here and looks like muscle is comes back to normal. Therefore, combination AV gene therapy is the most effective approach to prevent trauma-induced HO in FOP mice. Similar to human patients, FOP mice also spontaneously develop HO throughout whole body without any trauma or flares. Therefore, we tested the ability of our AV vectors to prevent spontaneous HO in FOP mice. No worries. We treated the FOP pups right after the birth with systemic injection of AV vectors. And then the six weeks later, we examined heterotopic bone formation throughout whole body using micro CT. As you see here, 
non-treated FOP mice developed the HO bone at multiple sites, including the upper spine and neck and joints and ankles. When treated with butant ACPL1 specific gene silencer or healthy ACPL1 expression dramatically decreased HO formation. Same thing is treatment with combination AV vector almost completely prevented spontaneous HO throughout whole body. Therefore, the systemic delivery of a combination AV vector at birth can prevent spontaneously developed HO in FOP mice. The since spontaneous HO in FOP patients often develops at young adult stage, we treated the six week old FOP mice with systemic injection of combination AV vector. 12 weeks later, we examined the heterotopic bone throughout whole body using micro CT. Non-treated FOP mice, this one, developed HO multiple sites near the neck and upper spine area and lower body and joints. But treatment with combination A vector almost completely suppresses spontaneous HO throughout the whole body and then total HO volume is dramatically decreased. As you see in the movie, the non-treated FOP mice is this one and very not active. They are not active and minimal movements in, in the corner. And this is a complete opposite to white type mice, healthy mice. And red arrow shows FOP mice with a combination AV treatment, which is uh, after treatment, this mice as their movement as active as white type mice, healthy mice. The, in summary, we sus uh, uh, successfully generated a combination AV vector with butant ACBR1 specific gene silencing and healthy ACBR1 uh, protein expression. This AV vector packaged to AV9 capsid via systemic injection, combination AV vector was delivered to HO forming FAP cells and all osteoblasts in the skeletal muscle. Upon the, in, in, uh, upon the entry of the cell, artificial microRNA specifically silenced butant ACBR1 expression at the same time, codon optimized ACBR1 DNA produces healthy ACBR1 protein. Therefore, this approach can reverse FOP cells to no more healthy cells. But definitely we need to optimize for safety and maximum therapeutic efficacy in human cells. Our next speaker is Dr. Julia Ortman, and she is my colleague uh, in UMass Chan Medical School. And Julia is an assistant professor of RNA Therapeutic Institute. She will give us a talk about silencing RNA technology in FOP. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Okay, I'm just going to share my slides now. Can everybody stream? Fantastic. Hello, everyone. I'm Julia Alterman, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about a technology called small interfering RNAs. And actually, small interfering RNAs are a lot like the gene silencers that Jay was just telling us about. So like those gene silencers, these small interfering RNAs can interfere with the mRNA that makes the mutant ACVR protein, and so therefore can prevent that protein from ever being made. So I wanted to take a little bit of a zoom in to the previous diagram that we've been shown both by Danielle and by Jay, that DNA turns into RNA, turns into protein. So when we look a little bit closer at these molecules, we see that both DNA and RNA are made up of these individual bases or letters that are the code that encode which protein should be made. And so what are small interfering RNAs? Well, small interfering RNAs is a very specific piece of RNA, so still the same coding material, that binds to and prevents another mRNA from making its protein. 
So these siRNAs are made up of two different strands. And one of those strands is called the guide strand. And it's called the guide strand because it actually matches a sequence on a specific gene. So in this case, it matches a sequence that's present in the ACVR1 mutant mRNA. And so because it matches this, this mRNA, it can bind to this mRNA. And the binding of this guide strand to the mRNA leads to the cleavage of the mRNA. So the mRNA will get completely degraded. And then the protein, the mutant ACVR protein, is never made. So you could imagine that this would be a really good way to try to treat these kinds of genetic diseases. Unfortunately, RNA by itself is very readily degradable. It can cause an immune response when it's delivered to cells, and it can be difficult to deliver without some kind of packaging. As Jay described, he uses an AAB to package his RNA. And so I will explain to you how we deliver these molecules. So there's actually been a lot of research in the field of how to deliver RNA effectively to the body. And this involves the use of different kinds of chemical modifications. And so what are these chemical modifications? Well, we can place these at multiple places within the molecule of the siRNA. We can modify the individual letters, the bases. We can modify the linkages between the bases. We can attach different kinds of conjugates, which will deliver you better to different tissues or to different cell types. And all of these together make these molecules extremely stable. They do not elicit an immune response. And they can be delivered to cells without any kind of packaging and then last a very long time for months and months, continuing to silence their target mutant mRNA. And so what I'm showing you on the right here is an example of how these work in cultures, so in cells. And so on the top, you can see a picture of cells and the cells are, we can see the nuclei of the cells in blue here. And the siRNA is labeled in red. And you can see that after we deliver this chemically modified siRNA to these cells, we get uptake into all of the cells in our field of view. And then when we look at the capability of these siRNAs to silence a target mRNA here on the bottom, we can see that when the RNAs are unmodified, there is no silencing because these are getting degraded immediately. But when the RNAs are modified with all of these modifications I told you about over here on the left, that we get beautiful silencing of our target gene. So we see that this works very well to actually make these RNAs like therapeutics. And so we describe these molecules as informational drugs because they carry a piece of genetic information that tells them what to do. And so this is very different from the small molecules that most of us are used to taking as therapeutics, such as ibuprofen. So with a small molecule, the structure of the small molecule decides both the what we call dianophore, which is how it delivers and which organs it goes to, as well as the pharmacophore, which tells you exactly what it's going to target. And so you can't really change the structure of the molecule without changing both of these things. This is not true for informational drugs. With informational drugs like small interfering RNAs, we can change the chemical architecture to change which organs this goes to. So if, it, if we want to target the muscle, we can change it to target the muscle. If we want to make it more potent and long lasting, we can add modifications to do that. But then once we've decided upon a scaffold that we like that delivers well to our organ of interest, we can plug in different sequences to target different genes and repurpose this molecule to treat a number of different genetic conditions. And so again, there are lots of different ways that we can kind of change the chemical architecture of these compounds. As I mentioned, we can change the backbone and the sugar. So this is the little bases and the connections between those bases. We can attach linkers and conjugates that can tell these molecules where to go. And of course, we can change the target sequence in order to target different genes of interest. 
And actually, these drugs exist and have been approved. There's a company, um, Al Nylum Pharmaceuticals, that has developed a beautiful scaffold that delivers very well to liver. And they, with this liver scaffold, have made a number of approved drugs that give very long lasting effects, up to six to maybe even 12 months after a single injection in patients. And so these are very promising new class of therapeutics. And actually my lab has worked to develop uh, chemical modification scaffolds that can target different kinds of organs. So we've started two companies out of the lab, Comanche Biopharma, in which we have developed a scaffold that delivers to placenta for the treatment of preeclampsia. And we've also developed a brain scaffold through Atalanta Therapeutics that allows you to deliver these molecules to the brain and treat a number of different kinds of neurodegenerative diseases. And so this is a really fascinating and exciting new area of research. So let's talk a little bit about how we might design siRNAs to target the muscle. Well, we actually have identified multiple conjugates that deliver to all different kinds of organs within the body. One of these conjugates in particular that we call DCA, and you can see what the structure of this conjugate looks like up here on the right, delivers beautifully to healthy muscle after a systemic injection. And we can also see in these pictures down here on the right, where the blue represents the tissue and the pink represents the siRNA, that we can not only deliver to healthy muscle, but we can also deliver to heterotopic bone cartilage, um, we can deliver to fibrotic areas, and we can deliver, and we can deliver to injured muscle. So we've actually used this scaffold to deliver to muscle before. Um, and we did this using a gene that is naturally present within your muscle, myostatin. And when you silence this gene myostatin, you can grow more muscle. So we wanted to see if we could design an siRNA against myostatin and see if we could see muscle growth. So we used this DCA conjugated siRNA and we delivered it systemically to mice. And you can see that we were able to silence the myostatin gene both in calf as well as in quad here to about 50%. And this resulted in significant growth in the muscle of these animals. So here you can just see the thighs of the treated animals have gotten larger. We then measured the size of those thighs and you can see that in fact, they have gotten significantly larger. And we also see the overall weight of the animal go up as a result of having an increased amount of muscle. But there's always new chemistry and ways to improve the effectiveness of these compounds. And so my group has developed some new chemistry that allows us to get even more silencing of these particular genes. So what you can see over here on the right is two, new, two uh, chemistries compared, the old chemistry and the new chemistry. And so you can see with the older chemistry, we were only getting about 50% silencing, as you can see up here on the left in the previous graph I showed you, as well as in these two graphs down here. But now when we use our new chemistry to deliver these siRNAs, we are getting up to 75 and maybe 80% silencing of those target mRNAs. And this should lead us to a more profound therapeutic effect and longer term duration of effect of these so that you can get injections far less often. So now let's switch gears and talk about how we can design these siRNAs to target one particular version of the gene. So in this case, we're designing them to target the mutant gene and not the wild type gene. So by going after a sequence where the mutant gene and the wild type gene are different, we are able to design siRNAs to target the sequence of the mutant gene without ever targeting the sequence of the wild type gene. And when we screened a number of these different compounds, you can see that we found uh, sequences that show very good silencing of the mutant ACDR1, the one that causes disease, while leaving completely alone the wild type copy of that gene. And we can see that when we actually test these siRNAs in patients, in patient-derived iPSCs that Jay mentioned earlier, 
that in the wild type or untreated version of these patient cells, there is at least 80% of the expressed protein or expressed gene are the mutant and only 20% are the wild type or the normal. But when we treat with our small interfering RNAs, you can see that now 96% of the expressed genes are the normal wild type genes. And there's only a very small fraction of the mutant copy expressed. So then we wanted to try it in one of Jay's mouse models of FOP. And in this case, we were curious as to whether small interfering RNAs would actually be able to use after injury. So in the case when a flare up has already begun. So in this case, this is how the experiment was designed. So first, um, the mouse was given a pinch injury, and then we waited three days, and then we injected transdermally, again, as Jay has mentioned previously, the DCA conjugated siRNA targeting ACBR1. We then waited four weeks and did x-ray and histology to look at whether there had been newborn formation. And I think what you can appreciate here is that after the treatment of the siRNA, so in the control where there was no siRNA, there's significant bone that has formed. But after treatment with the siRNA, we can see that there's a far smaller bone formed as a result of being able to target that mutant ACBR1. And on the right here, you're just seeing a graph that's showing that this is a significant reduction in bone growth. So this is a very exciting new modality for the treatment of FOP. And so thank you. And next, I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Shailish Agarwal, who is a medical doctor and assistant professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School, who will be talking to you today about leveraging a modified immune system to prevent FOP flares. With that, I will turn it over to you, doctor. Shailish, you're muted. Got it. Thank you, Dr. Alterman. Um, you should be able to see my slides now. And I'm just going to get them into presenter mode. There we go. There you go. So um, thank you. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. And thank you for um, everyone in attendance as well. Um, I am a, um, a reconstructive surgeon at uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. And um, FOP uh, is really something, is a, is a disease process that uh, I've spent a fair amount of time studying in the lab and as part of my training um, and research as well. Um, and it's something as a plastic surgeon uh, we're interested in understanding and learning more about because um, we take care of patients who have heterotopic calcification in other instances, like um, after even severe musculoskeletal trauma. So today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about using and leveraging the modified immune system to prevent FOP flares. And the goal of this presentation is really to talk about the objective that my lab has been working with um, and, uh, and then talking about how we're planning, how we're approaching this problem, this strategy, and how we're, um, and what our, what our findings have been thus far. So overall, our objective has been to develop a therapeutic strategy in which an anti-activant A therapy can be autonomously delivered at sites that are at risk for ectopic bone and FOP. This is a really, really dense objective with a lot of different parts to it. And so one of the things that I've, um, what I've done is kind of break it down into different parts to understand what are the different components of this objective. And each of those components of this objective are areas where we're basically building um, our research uh, strategy. So the first aspect is the anti-activant A therapy. And I think from the presentations that we've heard earlier, um, the an anti-activant A therapy has, um, you know, has obvious implications due to the role of activin A as a pathologic mediator for this disease process. And so, you know, I go back to literature um, from 2015 when first the uh, mutation was identified and subsequently the therapeutic strategy um, addressing the mutation specifically with anti-activin A therapy 
was delineated in um, through this uh, manuscript but in science translational medicine. And so, um, as we've heard earlier, the mutation uh, renders the, the BMP receptor, which is typically only responsive to bone morphogenetic proteins, to instead be receptive to, to active in A. Um, the challenge being that active in A is present in, um, in inflammatory conditions, which is why uh, these flare-ups are preceded by inflammation and trauma and injury, then leading to um, the bone formation at those uh, injury sites. And to kind of understand um, what, what was performed before uh, to demonstrate that specifically active in A was, um, was a pathologic uh, mediator of the mutation. Um, you know, we look back at, I look back at the literature to understand what they did in the science translational medicine paper. And one of the things that they did was they, they used a, a nucleic acid sequence um, that was responsive typically to bone morphogenetic proteins. But in FOP cells or in cells with the FOP mutation, that same nucleic acid sequence was suddenly responsive to active in A. And what that indicated was that the active in A uh, molecule was actually upregulating the same pathways that bone morphogenetic proteins typically do, leading to bone formation. Now, this point is this is a point which is both academic, but also has some therapeutic implications when, when we consider how to design a potential therapy. And I'll get back to that um, in a few slides later. So reviewing uh, some of the findings, um, they found that an anti-activin A therapy uh, does in fact uh, reduce uh, bone, bone formation uh, following trauma. And this is interesting. This is important because it verifies again that not only does activin A uh, mediate um, some of the findings of increased bone morphogenetic protein signaling, but it also, but inhibition of activin A is um, is also has therapeutic potential. Now there are um, there are challenges with uh, delivering any of these types of protein medications systemically, in the in the sense that there can be off target effects um, and there can be difficulty with determining how much to deliver, when to deliver. And so my goal really has been to develop a way for the body to know how much it needs and to be able to self dose. One of the things that's really important about um, anti-activin A peptides or proteins is that they are produced by cells. So when companies are making protein therapies, um, whether it's insulin, which we think of um, typically, but other types of proteins, recombinant proteins that are being used for uh, treatment, these proteins are being made um, in large bioreactors um, by cells that have been uh, designed to produce that specific protein. And then they're purified out. So taking, taking that idea that cells are the ones that are able to make these proteins is again, bringing me closer and us closer to thinking about cell therapies that can potentially produce an anti-activin A therapy. So the next question is how can, how can we think about only targeting sites that are at risk for ectopic bone and FOP? So instead of having to deliver a drug um, systemically, which may have off-target effects, uh, which may have adverse effects because maybe you need active in A in some other part of the body, we only want the anti-activin A therapy to be delivered to an area where there's ectopic bone formation. And so we've done uh, several studies to look at cell recruitment to sites of injury. And this is not, this is not um, new information. There have been hundreds, if not thousands of studies which have shown that marrow-derived cells traffic and migrate to inflammatory sites. So to sites of inflammation, um, these bone marrow cells come over. And oftentimes the first, uh, the first bone marrow-derived cells that come through are neutrophils, cells called neutrophils, cells called macrophages, and then other immune cells. So these are immune cells that basically mediate the inflammatory process. But then there are other cells that come in from the bone marrow as well that are part of the, um, that are part of the healing process as well. And so in our, in our lab, uh, we've actually developed a uh, strategy and implemented a strategy for bone marrow transplantation using um, FOP mice. So mice with the mutation for FOP 
um, have been uh, have received bone marrow transplantations from mice with the FOP mutation itself, in addition to a fluorescent label. So we can actually inject these uh, unlabeled mice with a fluorescent bone marrow with uh, the same mutation and show that it engrafts within the bone marrow. So what that means is that we're able to replace the FOP bone marrow with FOP bone marrow, but, but with a fluorescent label. And the reason we've been doing it this way is because now we're able to, in essence, show that we can take bone marrow that is the same genetic type and deliver it back into the mouse. And with, with an idea that in a human, we would be able to take their bone marrow, modify it, and then give it back to them as an, as an auto transplant. And so this is just showing using flow cytometry that we're able to verify the replacement of the, um, of the bone marrow of that mouse. And the reason that we use a fluorescent marker is because then you can detect the fluorescent marker and you know that the background of the recipient mouse has no fluorescence in it at all. So all the fluorescence that we see is derived from the cells that we directly injected into the mouse. So the next question is, can marrow-derived cells, so cells from the bone marrow, secrete an anti-activant A protein? So, you know, when they do it in the lab to create these drugs, uh, they basically use, they're called Chinese hamster ovary cells or CHO cells. And those cells are being used overwhelmingly to be able to produce um, proteins. But in this situation, we don't have those types of cells. We can't put those types of cells in a patient. And so the question is, can marrow-derived cells produce it? And so we created a plasmid that allows for expression of this anti-activant A therapy. We deliver that plasmid to bone marrow-derived um, stromal cells and bone marrow-derived hematopoietic stem cells. So two, two different populations of, of um, <clears throat> bone marrow resident cells. And what we saw was that indeed, not only did they produce this, the uh, protein, but that protein was actually released into the media. So it's not being stored just in the cell, it's actually being released to their environment, which is really important if we think about the cell therapy potentially releasing the drug where it needs to be released. And furthermore, what we found was that the drug that's being released, the anti activin A drug actually is therapeutic. It has actual functional effect. And that itself is important because whenever proteins are being produced and released, we have to make sure that they're actually functional and they're folded correctly, their biochemistry is correct. And the nicest way to look at their final biochemistry is to see if they have bioactivity, if they're active. And these proteins that are being produced are active. So our clinical goal really is to be able to um, isolate the bone marrow from a patient with FOP. And in that same for that bone marrow, modify it to produce. Um, the uh, anti-active NA therapy, and then transplant it back into the patient as an autologous uh, transplant. And finally, um, to have that bone marrow be autonomously regulated such that it, it will only produce the anti-active NA therapy when it needs to. And so for that, I go back to that slide where I showed, the, where I showed that graph. Um, that graph had a nucleic acid sequence that was responsive to active NA. And so if we actually harness that same nucleic acid sequence, we can create a nucleic acid sequence that has that particular element and the anti-active in a nucleic acid sequence. And so therefore, we can actually control the expression levels of our anti-active in a therapy using this nucleic acid sequence. So again, for a reminder, that's this sequence. It's called the BMP responsive element which is normally responsive to BMP as the name implies, but in this situation is also responsive to active in A. And so our ultimate goal is to engineer a closed loop feedback system where as active in A increases locally, our anti-active in A increases. And as a result, the active in A decreases and therefore the anti-active in A decreases. And so you get a feedback system much like how we think about insulin for um, blood sugars. And so as blood sugars go up, the insulin levels go up. And as the blood sugar comes back down in response to that, the insulin levels come, down, come back down as well. And so this pictorial basically depicts the, the overall goal. Um, and the translational potential for cell therapies is real. 
CAR T therapies um, have, have received increasing acceptance um, and they are part of um, cancer therapy now in clinical trial and um, actually being deployed as treatments. And the Mass General Brigham, which is where, uh, where I work, is highly invested in both gene and cell therapy development. And um, they've been very supportive of our, our laboratory's work as well. Uh, and so I see a lot of opportunity with cell therapies as an adjunct um, treatment strategy for our patients. Thank you. And I will um, give this back to uh, Danielle next. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. That was great. So many of these presentations are so cool. <laughs> I have a very fun job hearing about all this. Okay, okay so thank you everyone. Um, I hope that uh, you're as excited about this work as I am. Um, that we talked about gene therapy that Dr. Shim presented oh. and uh, the immunotherapy that Dr. Shalish presented and also the siRNA that Dr. Um, Alterman shared. So we are really excited to bring this th these elements of the toolbox together so that clinician scientists and those who treat those with FOP have lots of tools at their fingertips to help everyone live a complete and healthy life um, to the best of their ability um, and so that we can find an end to FOP. We um, wanted to take a moment before we start with questions that we will in a second here but we wanna acknowledge that this takes a village. It's not only the individuals that you've met here today, it's members of their team and also members of the Gene Therapy Working Group. This, these are collaborators and members of Dr. Shim's lab. We have members of uh, Dr. Alterman's lab. And we saw acknowledgements from Dr. Agarwal. So for now, I'd like to hand it over to Catherine Royce to um, field some of our questions that we'll share with our presenters. Um, we're excited to know what you think. Okay, so we do have quite a few questions. Um, Dr. Shem, I would say the first one is for you. Um, earlier in the presentation, it was said that muscle cells replenish every 15 years. Does that process happen in children who are growing more quickly? In other words, would the gene therapy not last as long if it's administered to growing children? Yeah, that is a great question indeed. So uh, AAV gene therapeutic efficacy will be more quickly diluted in uh, growing children than a fully grown adults. That's for sure because a children's body is growing, the cell is proliferating more than AAV therapeutics diluted. However, we believe it is important to treat children as quickly and safely as possible to prevent disability and that if other medications are needed and lower doses of those medications may be used together with silencing RNAs or uh, immunotherapies or polybiotins and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Um, Danielle, I think this question is, it came to you. How mm -hmm. long do you think gene therapy will last? So related to what uh, Dr. Shim just shared with us is that the skeletal muscle fibers that I showed last about seven, seven years and a complete skeletal muscle turnover takes about 15 years. So as Dr. Shim mentioned, as we go through that process, whether we are growing or we are repairing our bodies, it takes about 15 years of complete turnover and there is a dilution over time. But um, of the gene therapy, we can only have it once because your body will react to it and not accept it a second time. But 
By having the gene therapy on board early, we hope to prevent disability and also the ability of gene therapy to support health um, could mean that the other therapies that we showed you in that longitudinal slide, um, there's lower doses. So uh, lower doses, lower side effects. Um, so it's, it's really a, a large toolbox that we're working on. Thank you. Um, Dr. Alterman, you are being asked if you can inject the um, gene therapy you're working on into a flare. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think that we could probably inject it into a flare. Um, and then once it's injected into a flare, it should go into all of the cells that we saw in the earlier images. And then hopefully this would reduce the effect of the flare and minimize the formation of new bone. So that is certainly the hope. Okay. Um, Dr. Agarwal, this question is coming to you and it's about epigenetics. They're asking if there's a way to influence gene expression and setting up environmental factors or living conditions such that flare-ups don't occur. So uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question to see how we can um, modify in, to the environment around us. You know, I think that one of the things that um, is apparent, at least in the flare-ups, is that inflammation does play a large role in, uh, in this process, at least in these discrete intramuscular um, flare-ups. And so the question um, really comes down to, are there ways to modify the, the inf inflammation that's occurring? And ideally in a way that is still doesn't affect the overall ability of your body to respond to trauma and injury. And, you know, we can, we can all say to, to modify our environment so that we can minimize uh, exposure to trauma. But there are other things um, that that deserve um, evaluation as well, and, and that's why a lot of the a lot of the, the um, therapies that are being evaluated currently that are the small molecules outside of what we've talked about often are anti-inflammatory medications as well. So, but I think this is a this is a challenging question to understand um, how we can modify that uh, in a way that is therapeutic, that's controlled, that's uh, predictable. And um, that's, uh, I'm sure there are many people out there studying that, not necessarily for FOP, but for other conditions as well. Thank you. Um, okay, so Danielle, we have a question. This is something I hear families always ask researchers when. So this is a question <laughs> of when. How long will it be until gene therapy trials start? Can you address yeah, that? Yeah, um, I mean, that's always a tough one because... There's so many things we can control. We can plan an experiment, we can perform the experiment and we can get the results. But there are so many things outside of our control, how that experiment will ultimately turn out, what it will tell us, whether or not it tells us to move forward or go and do a second experiment or a third. And the other thing that we can't control is we can package up everything and go to the FDA or the EMA, other regulatory agencies and say, hey, we're ready to have a trial. And we ultimately need their permission to do it. Um, and they could say, you know what, we're not, we don't think you've established enough safety. We don't think you've established enough efficacy. And they can send us back to do more. So those are the things we can't control. Having said that, the earliest that, that we could reach a trial is three years, and most likely it will be longer than that. Um, but understanding that that researchers that you've heard from today and their colleagues, everyone is working um, as fast as they can to be safe and efficient in this process. Thank you. Dr. Agarwal, another question for you. Can diet and lifestyle modifications ensure the unhealthy gene is made irrelevant? Thank you for that question. And I think that that does um, dovetail a bit with um, the question about epigenetics and how to modify our environment and um, around us and our lifestyle. You know, the, the mutation, um, the ACVR1 mutation that is responsible for, for FOP, um, unfortunately, is a very powerful mutation. It's a very responsive mutation. And um, as, as we know, FOP affects patients from uh, across the world from across different cultural backgrounds, different lifestyles, different diets and environments, and yet FOP persists. And um, you know, my thought, my thought on this is that 
While there are things that may mediate how severe um, FOP may manifest, uh, I think ultimately, uh, you know, the gene therapies, the cell therapies, the, the pharmacologics are what's going to be required to, to be able to address this condition. Thank you. Um, Dr. Alterman, another question for you. Regarding the silencing RNA technology, what would be the side effects in a person's body with using that? Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, now that these molecules are really fully modified, you don't get some of the side effects that would be expected from a partially modified molecule. Mm -hmm. So they aren't eliciting any immune response, and they are very well tolerated by the body when you've chemically modified them. And we've seen this actually, like I said, in the approval of five different drugs that have shown very few, if any, side effects of these molecules. And so we don't know yet what it would be in a potentially new patient population um, with a different kind of disease pathology. But that's part of what we do when we investigate new drugs and try them in different systems, is we want to see how it might impact that population and then make sure that we do everything that we can to mitigate and minimize those side effects. But generally, the molecules are designed to be very specific so that they only target the gene of interest and are chemically modified to avoid any of the side effects that you would get from an unmodified RNA. Thank you. Um, Danielle, I'm going to send this one to you. As someone is asking, what would be the approach for adolescents and adults who already have heterotopic bone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so a lot of what we heard about today is to prevent the formation of bone. Um, and what do we do when we already have it? And so uh, there's two things that are happening. The ACVR1 gene, it's, it's affecting our ability or one's ability to regenerate muscle as well as forming bone. So we want to get rid of that bone. The, the wish list over time, the, the goal would be to remove that bone uh, through surgery and to use some of the approaches you've heard about today to prevent the recurrence of bone. But also we need to, and IFOPA has started looking at this, looking at what we can do in, in the field of muscle regeneration, because removing the bone is not enough. We, we will need to remove the bone, support muscle regeneration so that we're not just leaving that space empty and physical therapy and doing other things to really help you fully recover. And that's uh, a big part of my role is to look at the big picture today and down the road. Thank you. Dr. Shem, um, you're being asked, generating healthy genes within the body, is this possible without gene therapy? Uh, maybe not, but it's uh, the, basically it's the FOP patients that have two copies of uh, ACBR1. So one come from mother and the other one come from dad, but we don't know is which one is which because uh, FOP mutation is like a, happens spontaneously. So we don't know exactly why this happens, what happened, uh, what, what causes this mutation. However, so they always have two. And then is uh, FOP patients has one copy is normal. The other one has a mutation. However, the mutation, uh, their function is very strong, pretty much dominant over the healthy one. So only way we can suppress mutant copy is that we can add more and then we can dilute this mutant copy activity, or we're gonna specifically remove this mutant copy. So that's the only way we can uh, the, the make things better. So those, idea, these, the therapy is should be delivered by gene therapy uh, uh, approach. Thank you. Dr. Agarwal, you mentioned diabetes type 1 when you were speaking. Is there a link between diabetes type 1 and FOP? No, there's, a, there's no clear link between the two, um, but my, my goal was to show that there is that the body has different ways of regulating protein production. And the way that the body regulates protein production, say when we're thinking about, um, about blood sugar is when the blood sugar levels go up, then insulin levels go up. And so you get this closed loop feedback system. 
And it's when that closed loop system gets dysregulated or there's a problem with it that we get disease. Um, and in this, in this situation, what, what I'm looking at with FOP is how to, um, how to create an, an artificial closed loop system to produce a drug um, internally in that patient. Um, so that, that drug becomes produced internally, it turns on and turns off whenever it's needed, similar to how insulin is turned on or turned off as it's needed. Um, all therapies, Danielle, I'll send this to you. All are all therapies equally effective in suppressing heterotopic ossification. So actually, I'm going to pass that over to Dr. Agarwal as our resident physician, who has um, I, I know the answer, but he has much more experience in in how patients respond to treatment. So, Dr. Agarwal, are all therapies that are under developed equally effective in suppressing HO? Uh, you know, I think a lot of that comes down to how how much um, each has been extensively studied in clinical trials. One of the one of the challenges is they haven't been studied head to head, so we it's hard to make direct comparisons. Um, and the adverse effects of each of these drugs are different. So when we're thinking about effic efficacy of a drug, we also want to think about what the adverse effects are and what the risks are. Um, if, if one drug may completely eliminate a condition, but come with a series of, of side effects that are undesirable or, or challenging for a patient to, to live with, then it may be better to have a drug that works 75% as well with much fewer side effects. And so being able to do those head-to-head -head comparisons, um, when we look at the list of different medications that are either um, under investigation or um, now approved, is part of um, the future development of, uh, of our therapeutic strategies. It's the reason why um, blood pressure control is still something that, that other companies are studying all the time. It's because there is no single answer that's the best and head-to-head -head comparisons are being done all the time. I think, I think where we're working right now is trying to develop, um, develop a drug that we feel very confident in uh, using these different strategies. Uh, and then being able to then later look at how do they compare with each other. But Danielle, I, I, don't, I don't actually have as good of an answer about which one maybe in preclinical studies have shown the most um, efficacy. And if, if you have that info, it'd be great to, for us to learn about it too. Yeah, um, I can say preclinical studies, um, preclinical by definition is, is your mouse studies, right? Yeah. And so um, preclinical studies, are, these drugs are very effective, but mice are not humans, humans are not mice. And so, as you said, Dr. Agarwal, it sort of comes down to what happens in a clinical trial and then what happens when you can compare them and what happens, you know, side effects for one person may not be uh, very difficult, whereas they might be difficult for someone else. And so there's gonna be some personalized med medicine in our future. Yeah, I think I think it's it is actually um, encouraging that there are multiple different options, and it's possible, like you said, that that maybe drug A won't work, won't be as well tolerated by some patients, but drug B will be, and so that's why having so many different strategies um, is important. And we're not you know not putting all of our eggs in one basket, but rather kind of um, uh, diversifying the portfolio is so important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Along those lines, a follow-up question, is there an estimate, again, timing, is there an estimate on how many years it may take to turn these kinds of options into a cure or effective treatment? Gosh, I think that uh, that's so tough because that's always the burning question, when. Um, and I think that I can say that you know, everything we've shown you today and in, in, in that longitudinal slide that we listed everything that's under development, it's as if all the pots are cooking on the stove. And so we're, we're working on it and things are coming out every day, but research is a slow process. Um, and we, I, I can confidently say where we will be in five years time is different than where we are today but I can't say where we're going to be. And that sounds terribly evasive, but uh, perhaps our, our panelists can um, 
help us with that answer as well, who those who are in the fight. Yeah, if I can add a little bit more. So, I mean, as Daniel said, and as uh, uh, Dr. Agor said, I mean, although it looks like our gene therapy works great, but doesn't mean it's uh, this gene therapy gonna change to drug right away. Uh, as Daniel and Dr. Edward said, so we need the safety test. They definitely we should improve safety, and then we start to juggle safety versus therapeutic efficacy. That's in mice, right? Then we have to change to large animal. So then it's a one set large animal toxicity test, et cetera, et cetera. All the safety tests is done. Then we may move on to clinical phase, which is takes long too because then we need a lot of drugs. It's not just a mouse treatment amount. We literally need a human treatment amount. So then we need really big factory generating AAV or sRNA. So these are also very, should be very clean and is more uh, 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 drug quality level. So that's the reason why is that every step needs time. Every step needs kind of takes, yeah, it, 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 it's, very careful step. It's not just simply we're gonna do right away. So right, Julia? Yes, yes, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, a lot goes into developing a safe therapeutic. Um, and we have all of these um, rules and regulations in place to make sure that when we finally do go into clinical trials in patients, that the patients that we're doing the trials on are safe or are as safe as we can make them, right? And so this requires doing many experiments in smaller animals as well as larger animals and finding out every little thing that can go wrong. You have to determine what the maximum tolerated dose is, right? So we need to try different doses and make sure that, you know, you can inject up to a certain amount without any safety signal whatsoever. And all of these studies need to be done in a clean and well-regulated environment um, prior to being able to say that they are safe to bring into humans. And this is to protect all of us. Um, and so that can take some time. And, you know, depending on you know, how you've designed your clinical trial, the FDA may have a number of requirements of things you need to try. Like you need to try multiple doses all at the same time, or you need to look out six months to a year after your initial injections to see if even though you didn't see any safety signals in the beginning that you also aren't seeing any safety signals down the line. We won't, don't want to deliver something that in a year or two years time is gonna be causing a problem. And so all of these studies need to be done prior to actually starting to deliver to patients. Um, and, and that's just part of how drug development works. And so unfortunately, it never really goes as fast as you want it to. Um, but this is because, you know, we're following the regulations that were put in place to protect everybody. Um, but I can promise you, too, that all of the researchers on this call and all of the people as part of the IFOPA are very, very driven and will make the process go as quickly as we can. So while remaining within those bounds of safety and regulations, we will make sure that we can get these drugs as quickly to patients as possible because we really value you as well. Thank well you, Dr. Said. Um, we have one last question and it's for Dr. Agarwal. Can you talk um, a little more about what it means to manipulate the immune system to combat FOP? What does that mean? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so, so the, 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 the general underpinning of, of what I'm interested in is that the immune system basically goes to where it's needed and it goes to sites of inflammation. And the, the immune system is what basically predicts where many of these lesions will occur because it is the cause of those, of those lesions to some extent when it releases the active in A locally in the muscle and causes the inflammation. And so the question is, we can't eliminate the immune system from a patient because if we eliminate the immune system completely, then um, patients are susceptible to infections. Um, this is kind of, that, that's been the challenge that we see in other clinical conditions like transplantation where patients have to be on large dose immunosuppression. So instead, 
What I mean by modifying the immune system is to modify the immune system to be able to actually stop or to produce an inhibitor that we've introduced in the gene sequence. So basically getting these immune cells, modifying these immune cells to produce an inhibitor against the drug that, that is being present in the area. And to do that, um, we would basically modify these immune cells such that, they, um, that they're able to produce the drug and then turn off their production of the drug over time as well, and then turn it back on when they need to. And so really it's, it's all about using the way that the immune cells travel around the body to be able to let them decide when and where the drug needs to be produced. And the, the lessons that I'm taking from are the CAR T therapy, which is T cells that are being used to treat cancer. And so those T cells are delivered into patients and they basically, we don't know, they don't know where the cancer is. The, the doctor doesn't know where the cancer is. The patient doesn't know exactly where the cancer is. But when they give the T cells in, into the patient, those T cells naturally home, they go towards the cancer. And when they go towards the cancer, they attack the cancer. And so that is, um, that's the general idea of using a modified immune system to find, to seek and destroy. And that, that's, that's the goal here. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. That's all of the questions um, that came in. Thank you everyone for sending those questions. As a reminder, there will be a survey that launches as soon as this webinar ends, and we really appreciate your feedback. Thank you, Danielle, for leading this webinar, and thank you, Dr. Shem Agarwal and Alterman for being part of this and, and just giving us incredible information and an update for our FOP families around the world. Thank you to all of you who joined us. This It was very early this morning for us on the East Coast of the United States, but uh, wherever you are in the world, we really appreciate your time. And, um, and thank you again for your questions. Have a great day and take care.